Hello and welcome. I'm Peter and thanks for joining me today as I review Traced, a recent book by Dr. Nathaniel Jensen of Answers in Genesis. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Dr. Jensen's insights and some of the problems with his work. If you enjoy my channel, please make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks. So who exactly is Dr. Nathaniel Jensen? Well, he's a researcher and speaker at Answers in Genesis. He is a PhD in cell and developmental biology from Harvard University, and he's the author of a number of publications, including a book called Replacing Darwin and a number of scientific journal articles, many of which are in the Answers Research Journal. For a while now, Dr. Jensen has been interested in studying human diversification and its correlation to a biblical model. And specifically, he's been focusing on mitochondrial DNA and more recently, the Y chromosome. So what exactly is the Y chromosome? Well, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes and our 23rd pair is called the sex chromosomes. Males have an XY typically and females have two X chromosomes. And basically, because of that, we know that the Y chromosome is passed on only in the paternal lineage. That is, males pass it on to their male children. And females don't have a Y chromosome to pass on. Meaning that we can basically form a tree of the Y chromosome. And ultimately, from a young Earth creationist perspective, we should expect that they should all converge back to a single ancestral individual, namely Noah, because Noah was the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, his three sons, and therefore all of them inherited Noah's Y chromosome. And that is basically the gist of Dr. Jensen's work, to look at the Y chromosome data and determine whether or not the number of mutations that we see on the Y chromosome fit within a young earth creationist perspective and whether or not they go back to a single ancestor or a very small starting population. There's been quite a bit of hype around this book in the Young Earth Creationist community. You'd be amazed how many people I've run into who are just lay people who have been like, oh, did you hear about this new book where we can find Noah in our DNA? It's pretty crazy how widely pushed this book has become so quickly. And part of this is some of these hype statements, like by Ken Ham here, Dr. Jensen has found the Rosetta Stone of human history, which is probably a bit of an overstatement, even if Dr. Jensen is correct in his conclusions. But this book has become pretty widely known about, at least in the community, even if people haven't actually read it themselves. One thing which surprised me about Trace was how much of the book had to do with the origin of ancient cultures, like Greece and Egypt, rather than this Y chromosome connection to Noah, which was what I was expecting to be the main focus of the book. And really, I think that is the main goal of the book. That's why it's receiving the hype that it is. That's why young earth creationists especially are interested in the book, not because of the origin of these cultures, but rather because of the promise that we can find Noah in our genome. And that's what I really want to focus on specifically today because that's what I'm most interested in and most familiar with. But be warned that a lot of trace doesn't actually have to do that with that. It has to do with the origin of these different Y chromosome lineages in all of these different regions around the world. So what exactly is Dr. Jensen's goal? I think Dr. Jensen's main objective with this book is to understand how humans diversified following the flood using specifically the Y chromosome. And to do so, what he wants to do is look at the accumulation of mutations in the Y chromosome and the mutation rate and basically try to extrapolate backwards to see if the last common ancestor of the Y chromosome lived around the time of Noah, whether or not we can trace the Y chromosomes of modern men back to three main groups being Noah's sons and other such things that would relate the genetics to a young earth creationist framework of history. So what exactly is Dr. Jensen's argument? Dr. Jensen is basically trying to understand how exactly 
the history of the Y chromosome mutational load can fit within a young earth creationist framework. And to do so, he basically requires a knowledge of how many mutations there are on the male Y chromosome, and then also how many mutations occur in a generation. That is, how many mutations on the Y chromosome does a son get from his father. One of the problems which Dr. Jensen faces is that the Y chromosome mutation rate, as typically understood by scientists, leads to a much, much longer history of man, surpassing 6,000 years even. And thus, Dr. Jensen needs to use a different mutation rate. And in his book, he makes the case that we should use a faster mutation rate based on some of the studies which he cites. And I'm not going to go into that because that's pretty technical and I'm not sure that I could really give you the best opinion on whether or not that is a correct mutational rate to use. However, I want you to note that there is some disagreement on whether that is an appropriate mutational rate to use or not. Another assumption which Dr. Jensen needs for his conclusion to be correct is that the mutation rate is the same as the substitution rate. What does that mean? Well, the mutation rate is the number of mutations which occur on the Y chromosome from the father to the son, so within a single generation. But the substitution rate is the rate at which these mutations get fixed in the population. And so it's very actually problematic that Dr. Jensen is treating the mutation rate to be the same as the substitution rate because just practically that's not actually how mutations accumulate in populations. And so that's pretty problematic right there. But that is one of the assumptions which he uses to get his data. So what exactly does Dr. Jensen find? Well, when he takes the number of differences, uses a faster mutational rate, and treats substitution the same as the mutation rate, he finds that you can get all of this human diversity within the 4,000 years. And he also finds that close to the base of the tree, there are three major partitions, this phylogenetic tree that he creates that you can see here. There are three major partitions, which he identifies as an African group, an Asian group, and a European group, broadly, which he correlates then to Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So did Dr. Jensen just demonstrate that we can trace humanity's Y chromosome back to Noah's three sons? Well, not so fast. I think there are some problems with Dr. Jensen's work. First of all is his exclusion of ancient DNA. Now, given that Dr. Jensen is attempting to trace humanity's Y chromosome, all the way back to Noah, you would think that he would want to look at the Y chromosome of ancient individuals who lived closer in time to Noah than we do. But that's not what he does. Instead, he looks at the Y chromosome of modern people and uses that to attempt to reconstruct history. And this, to me, is one of the biggest flaws in his work, this complete kind of overlooking of ancient DNA. And he has a reason why he attempts to do that, but I think his reasoning there is somewhat problematic. So here's the problem. Dr. Jensen has found that he can fit the Y chromosome diversity of modern humans into this about 4,000 year time span from Noah to the present, using a couple assumptions which may or may not be faulty. But to do so, he has to exclude these other ancient people groups, such as Neanderthals, such as Denisovans, such as Homo heidelbergensis, all of whom we have DNA for. And because of that, I think this analysis is flawed. Why? Well, if he were to include those ancient genomes, what we would find is that the root of the family tree lies much further back. Dr. Jensen places the root of the human family tree as the common ancestor of Homo sapiens, the modern species alive today. But there were many other species of humans in the past, such as Neanderthals, such as Denisovans, which may or may not be their own separate species, but you get the point. There are these other people whose DNA we have that Dr. Jensen can't include in his model because it breaks the model and causes it to use more than 4,000 years of time. And I'm by no means the first to point this out. Many people, including Dr. Robert Carter, another young earth creationist geneticist, has also pointed this out in his review of Traced. And I think he had something really interesting to say. Listen to this. Traced includes no significant discussion of the burgeoning new field of ancient DNA studies. There is a trend among many creationists to discount ancient DNA. Many claim the data are riddled with errors 
and therefore cannot be trusted. And then skipping down a little bit. Also, given a 3 billion letter genome, and given the fact that only a relatively few nucleotides are phylogenetically informative, the usefulness of ancient DNA is a matter of statistics. One can infer which branch an individual belongs to even with highly fragmentary DNA. Creationists who reject all ancient DNA studies are missing a wealth of information that tells us about population growth and movement in the darkest periods of human history. This is the true Rosetta Stone. And I 100% agree with Dr. Carter on this, that ancient DNA from people like Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo heidelbergensis is really the Rosetta Stone, if you will. It's what will open us up to a better understanding of human history, especially as we continue to find more ancient genomes, hopefully from Homo naledi soon and other ancient human species. But to understand exactly why Dr. Jensen tries to exclude ancient DNA from his analyses, we have to go back a bit further, even further than his 2019 paper about the Y chromosome, back to when Dr. Jensen was putting out papers on the mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is unique because it's separate from the rest of your DNA and it exists in a little structure called the mitochondria, an organelle which produces power basically for your cell in the form of a molecule called adenosine triphosphate. But inside of this structure, there's a little circular loop of DNA called mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA. And this is important because it's basically the opposite of Y chromosome DNA, meaning that it allows us to trace backwards the maternal history. So unlike the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA is passed on to both male and female offspring. But during reproduction, only the female's mitochondrial DNA is contributed to the embryo. And thus, we all inherit our mitochondrial DNA from our mother, even though our father also has mitochondrial DNA as well. In 2015, Dr. Jensen released a paper in the Answers Research Journal entitled, Mitochondrial DNA Clocks Imply Linear Speciation Rates Within Kinds. Listen to what he says here. Because the Bible puts the date of creation at six to 10,000 years ago and the date of the flood under 4,350 years ago, speciation under the young earth view is much more rapid than speciation under the evolutionary view. Hence, rather than rely solely on mutation and natural selection to explain the diversity of life within kinds, many young earth creationists have proposed novel mechanisms for speciation. And skipping down a little bit, he says, concurring with wise, would observe that the scripture records the very rapid post-flood appearance of modern species in at least four kinds, adding further support to the hypothesis of a burst of speciation. However, Wood proposed a slightly different mechanism for species origins, one which was transposable element mediated but environment and or mutation triggered. So we note that in this paper, Dr. Jensen is picking up on a disagreement between various groups of creationists. Some creationists would believe that organisms diversified very quickly following the flood and that things slowed down after that, whereas Dr. Jensen presumably would argue that speciation rates have about been the same since the flood. And he attempts to argue this and makes the case that based on several different created kinds, we can observe that speciation rates and mutation rates have basically kind of been the same through time. And note that this is connected to his work on the Y chromosome because he's arguing that using modern mutation rates, we can basically fit the entire Homo sapiens lineage within 6,000 years just using normal mutational rates is his argument. We don't need organisms to diversify quickly is his whole argument, right? Now this isn't to say that Dr. Jensen wouldn't say that speciation happens quicker than evolutionary scientists would because he does in fact say that in the paper but he simply doesn't go as far as some of the other creationists does. But he has an interesting section in this paper because in this particular paper, he actually did use Neanderthal DNA, uh, Denisovan DNA, as well as Homo heidelbergensis DNA. So why did he use it here and not in other papers? Let, let's listen to what he said. The branch length patterns among the three nodes in the human tree lent further support to the exclusion of fossil sequences from consideration in the present analyses. When the Homo heidelbergensis, Homo sp altai, and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis mitochondrial genomes were included in the analysis, two facts were immediately apparent. First, these sequences were indeed quite divergent from the mitochondrial DNA sequences of extent human ethnic groups. 
Second, all three fossil sequences branched off from the exclusively African lineage. This suggested that if the fossil sequences were indeed reliable, they represented a subsection of the African lineage with an unusually high mutation rate. Alternatively, these sequences may still be degraded. Regardless of which of these two explanations was true, fossil sequences clearly represented an unusual set of data, and these data did not contradict the assumption in modern lineages of constant rates of mitochondrial DNA mutation through time. What Dr. Jensen found odd here is how divergent these ancient human populations like Neanderthals were and how they branched off from the African lineage. Now, this I think would be very strange for Jensen to attempt to incorporate in his model because in his model, he is using Homo sapiens as the root of the tree. So he's saying that Noah basically looked like us and that Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo heterobrigensis, all of these different humans originated from the Homo sapiens population. But problematically, what happens then if you treat Homo sapiens as the root of the tree is that all of these come from the African population, which would somehow mean that these early Africans, descendants of Ham, moved to Africa. So what's the problem here? Well, Dr. Jensen recognizes that these ancient genomes are very divergent from those of modern humans, and that they all stick out from the African lineage. Now, this is important because for Dr. Jensen, that doesn't make a lot of sense because he's using Homo sapiens as the root of the tree. So he would say that Noah looked essentially modern, just like you or me, and that Homo sapiens basically gave rise to groups like Neanderthals and Homo heidelbergensis and Denisovans. The problem with this is that that means that descendants of Ham basically populated not only Europe, but also way out into Asia, which is something that doesn't have biblical support. He also notes that to make this happen, he would have to have an unusually high mutation rate within this African population to get from Homo sapiens all the way out to Neanderthals or Denisovans or Homo heidelbergensis, which once again is rather odd. So Dr. Jensen's problem here is assuming that Noah and his sons were all Homo sapiens individuals. Why is that problematic? Well, we know that Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo heidelbergensis were all human. They were all descendants of Adam and Eve. And as a group, Homo sapiens, the worldwide species today, shares a common ancestor with Neanderthals specifically. And so we know that Noah, who's back at the root of this tree, is the common ancestor of both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, and that would probably indicate that he is neither Homo sapiens nor Homo neanderthalensis. Why is that a problem? Well, Dr. Jensen recognizes that Africans stick way out, and he has to basically come up with an ad hoc assumption that, well, maybe they just have a higher mutation rate. And then to get these other humans, maybe they need an even higher mutation rate, though he did say that possibly those are the result of degradation, which we'll get to in just a minute. But to understand this, that Africans had a higher mutation rate is actually not a necessary assumption. What instead makes more sense of the data is that Africans branched off of the Homo sapiens lineage very early on, and possibly the first group to branch off of this emerging species. And that is kind of congruent with the data that we have. The most morphologically divergent people are like the Khosan tribes in Africa, as well as the most genetically divergent people also live in Africa, which would indicate that they branched off first rather than having high mutation rates and becoming very divergent later on. So Dr. Jensen has some problems. First, these other human DNA sequences actually break this young earth creationist time frame if he assumes this linear speciation rate, which is what he's arguing for. And at the same time, they also cause problems in this phylogeny that he causes because they stick out from Africans, which is just really, really weird, for him at least. So what does he do? He makes the argument that ancient DNA is degraded, and so he discontinues use of ancient DNA in his further analyses. And he was critiqued for this by a paper by uh, Stefan Frello. And Stefan picked up on something that Jensen had written, namely, that Neanderthal DNA was, quote, plagued with DNA contamination from microorganisms and modern human DNA. And Stefan wrote this, 
If either of the two first, here he was referring to high mutation rates or contamination, were true, we should expect various Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA sequences to be at least as different from each other as each of them are from the mitochondrial DNA from modern humans. This is far from being the case. Simply put, Stefan's critique is that if Neanderthals were the result of this very rapid mutation, or if their genomic sequences are caused by the degradation of DNA, that they shouldn't form such a nice neat clay. They should be very disparate, very different from one another. Dr. Jensen authored a response to Frello's critique in 2017 entitled, Response to On the Creationist View on Mitochondrial DNA. Now, as a quick side note, he wrote a very short abstract. This was the entire abstract. Frello criticizes papers that he hasn't carefully read. Not surprisingly, his objections turn out to be unfounded. This probably doesn't even meet the minimum word requirement for your typical abstract and doesn't really contain any discussion of like what his actual argument is, but that was rather humorous to me at least. But here's what he says. He has several main arguments for why he believes that Neanderthal DNA is too degraded to use. So first, Dr. Jensen argues that it takes a very short amount of time for DNA to degrade. And thus, the DNA that we have from ancient humans is very unlikely to actually tell us much about their genome. He says, in the lab, even if we store DNA in a minus 20 degrees Celsius manual defrost freezer, we would discard DNA samples that were over a year old. Beyond a year, the DNA samples gave unreliable and unpredictable results. How much more caution is warranted when dealing with DNA that has sat in an open and fluctuating environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years? So basically, he's arguing that the DNA that we have is just unreliable. It degrades too quickly to really be informative, even after only a year. And I think there's a lot of problems with this because we've sequenced the DNA of a lot of people, which is older than a year, and found it to be virtually identical to our own. I mean, just look at like ancient people, like we've sequenced all sorts of ancient genomes from Native Americans to you know, Egyptians to people who have been found preserved as mummies, and we can find that their genomes are nearly identical to those of modern people, and we see we can sometimes even identify their descendants. So, you know, whatever Jensen's personal experiences with DNA degradation might be, that's simply not an actual feasible explanation because we have very well preserved DNA from ancient samples. How do we know this? Well, as I said before, it's virtually identical to our own. So how does that DNA end up being virtually identical to our own while at the same time having degraded too far to be even used? The only way which Jensen could even claim that is through somehow contamination, modern human DNA gets mixed in with it. But that brings in a whole host of other problems as well. Then Jensen goes on. Second, even if we assume that Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA sequences are reliable, they don't fit any scientific model, young earth creation or evolution, when we assume that rates of mitochondrial DNA mutation have been constant. With respect to the evolutionary timescale, current rates of mutation are much too high to explain the origin of modern humans, let alone the origin of Neanderthals and Denisovans. With respect to the young earth creationist timescale, Current rates of mitochondrial DNA mutation are too low to explain the differences between ancient DNA samples and modern human mitochondrial DNA sequences. But rather than actually saying, well, that, that means that both evolutionary and young earth creationist interpretations of the genome must be incorrect, Jensen instead takes the approach that the ancient DNA samples themselves are correct and not the models that both evolutionists and creationists have built based on them. And then he says this, Third, if non-constant mutation rates are to be invoked, only the young earth creationist model invokes them in a scientific manner. With respect to evolution, evolutionists will likely invoke some sort of mutational slowdown to reconcile the current contradictions between their prediction and in fact. Since current rates of mutation are too high, both for modern and extinct humans, they will probably resort to natural selection or to slower past rates in the molecular process of mitochondrial DNA mutation. Regardless of which specific explanation they invoke, their explanation must result in testable, falsifiable predictions. One thing that I found amusing is this next quote. He says, To reject my claims about Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA, Frello must propose a better, testable, predictive explanation for modern and ancient human DNA samples. And at a minimum, Frello must provide an independent test of the reliability of ancient DNA. So you can see here, Jensen 
is kind of stuck. He has to basically try to put the burden of proof on Frello because really he bears the burden of proof because not only scientists, but also the lay community and even people at Answers in Genesis, including Ken Ham himself have come out and said that we can trace, you know, our genome back to Neanderthals and thus our ancestors interbred with Neanderthals. And so really Jensen here is in the position where he bears the burden of proof to prove that ancient DNA is unreliable and he tries to pass that off to Frello. Overall, I think Dr. Jensen's main point that ancient DNA is unreliable is incorrect because we have very well preserved samples of ancient DNA. We have high coverage analyses of the DNA of ancient humans like Neanderthals. And we have all sorts of computer programs which can also help us look for error within ancient DNA. And so I think ancient DNA is really the reliable thing here. And rather than excluding ancient DNA from our analyses, we ought to accept it, whether that disproves the current models that we hold or not, because the data is more important than the models. The whole point of a model is to incorporate data into it, to explain data. And rather than doing that, Dr. Jensen is trying to exclude data because it falsifies and confuses his model. So if ancient DNA is actually reliable, what does this tell us? Well, I think we need a different framework from looking at it. I think it's incorrect to assume that Homo sapiens is the root of the tree because all sorts of other human species existed in the past. Rather, it appears to me that a different human species likely was ancestral to those that we see today, including Homo sapiens, meaning that Noah and his sons probably belonged to a different species of human than Homo sapiens, and that that ancestral species gave rise to Neanderthals, to Denisovans, to Homo heidelbergensis, and also to Homo sapiens. And this, I think, is most congruent with the data. And also that from the fossil record. That's another thing that Dr. Jensen doesn't really bring up, but the fossil record clearly shows that Neanderthals and these other humans kind of like predate um, the Homo sapiens. And there's other types of humans that are much older, like Homo erectus is much older than the earliest Homo sapiens fossils that we find. Now going to morphology, morphology is important and it's something that Dr. Jensen also overlooks because he's focused on the Y chromosome specifically. But morphology also allows us to build a phylogenetic tree. And when we look at phylogenetic trees based on morphology and those based from genetics, we can often see that they line up together. And that tells us that we might be onto something. And what we find fascinatingly is that when we look at a morphology based uh, phylogeny of the human family tree, Homo sapiens is this kind of off branch, this later off branch. And that when we root it, even using a midpoint, um, what we find is that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens share a common ancestor, not that Homo sapiens is um, ancestral to these other types of humans. And so that correlation between the phylogenetic analysis using um, the morphology and also the phylogenetic analysis that we could do with DNA, which would also show that Neanderthals and modern humans share a common ancestor, indicates together that Jensen is wrong here, that Homo sapiens isn't at the root of the tree. So what exactly do we do then? Ancient DNA seems to indicate that this last common ancestor of all Y chromosomes lies further back than Jensen says. And that would indicate that these three uh, groups, which Dr. Jensen identifies as Noah's sons, aren't actually his sons at all, but some later people in the Homo sapiens lineage. Which would seem to be a bit of a coincidence, right? That this Homo sapiens lineage happens to have these kind of three ancestral nodes of the Y chromosome. But I think it is likely simply to be a coincidence because of all the data which supports Homo sapiens being a later species rather than an ancestral one. Dr. Jensen in his book also attempts to make a correlation between the individuals listed in the table of nations in Genesis 10 and the groups of on the Y chromosome. And I think this is a tenuous relationship to make because the people listed in the table of nations aren't necessarily all of the people alive at the time. And it seems that the author of Genesis, Moses, when he's writing this, probably isn't thinking about the whole world, but is rather focusing on people whom he knew. 
And that might explain why exactly the table of nations is so geographically limited in terms of where it talks about people occurring in the ancient world. So overall, what does this tell us? Well, this extreme divergence of all of these past human groups, I think actually negates Dr. Jeanson's assertion that speciation happens linearly within the human kind. Why is that? Well, in his article, he noted that mutation rates would be higher if we needed to produce these Neanderthal genomes. And I think that for these individuals to fit within a young earth creationist framework, we actually do need this rapid speciation, which is what Jeanson is attempting to argue against in his book and in his various publications. And I think that ancient DNA is really important because it tells us about the relationships, the interbreeding between these groups, and ancient DNA for me is really what breaks traced. So let me give you a little bit of a kind of conclusion wrapping this all together. I think the biggest overarching problem of Jensen's work is the assumption that Homo sapiens is at the root of the human family tree. From the fossil record, we know that Homo sapiens is a rather recent occurrence, at least compared to, you know, some such as Homo erectus, which are found in much lower, older layers. Now, Homo sapiens probably uh, appeared around the time of Abraham because we know that the Jews as a group are descendants of Abraham, and thus we can kind of look at the ancestor of that group and identify him as a Homo sapiens. But around that time in the Young Earth Creationist framework is probably when Homo sapiens becomes the dominant human form and these other humans begin to die out in these various parts of the earth. So from a creationist perspective then, I think it's necessary to recognize that there are these other groups of humans who are very divergent both morphologically and genetically, and that that divergence indicates that they are not descendants of us. And really morphologically, that's a very hard case to make and genetically too. Instead that we share a common ancestor with Neanderthals and with the human group as a whole. And that that root from which all of these different humans diverged is the root at which Noah and his three sons will be found, not within the range of Homo sapiens. Overall, it's great that Dr. Jeanson is attempting to wrestle with this problem because I think it is a very important problem that does need to be addressed within Young Earth Creationism. But I don't think that Dr. Jeanson's solution really answers the problem and it ignores, I think, some of the most important data which we have. And as a result, I am going to disagree with Dr. Jeanson's conclusions that he has found these three ancestral Y chromosome lineages that are Noah's three sons. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you don't, please leave a comment. Tell me why I'm wrong. Thanks for watching.